Great. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 11th Annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machik with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service, and I am moderating the management track today. And assisting me is Shauna Kosegi, and she works for the Southwest Wisconsin Library System. Thank you, Shauna, and we're so glad all of you are here. Our presenter for this session is Michelle Fritz. She is a Wisconsin native. We we found out, well, kind of, yes, kind, yes, um, did live in, in Waukesha for some time. And she's going to be talking about 10 rules to successfully manage change. And so Michelle, please begin when you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks so much for having me and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, so, I think we all know this, but change is hard, but leaders who know how to manage change can help staff get on board and work together to achieve a shared goal. I'm sure we can all list changes that we managed well, and because of that, they were successful. And I think we can all think about changes that we've either managed or been a part of that maybe didn't go so well. Um, and so what I, what I did is I've created this 10 rules of change that I hope will help you identify why certain change initiatives were successful and why other change initiatives may have been a little bit more challenging. So when I was getting my master's in learning and organizational change, I took a class on designing and implementing strategic organizational change. We studied organizational change in depth during the class, exploring the theory, the research, and the practice. We read and applied that research to case studies and our own change experiences and we reflected on our past successes and failures. One of our final assignments was to synthesize all we had learned and were charged with creating our 10 rules of change. That was almost 10 years ago, but I have to admit that much of my list has stayed the same over the last 10 years. Of course, some rules have changed or my understanding has deepened or something should as I have continued to manage and participate in major change initiatives at multiple organizations, you would expect that this list would kind of, you know, things might change, go up and down, or um, might become a little bit more fleshed out. But knowing that much of this list has stayed the same and consistent over the last 10 years shows me that there are steps you should take in every change initiative if you want to be successful. I have worked on a lot of change management projects, including major systems changes, moving from one integrated library system to another. I have migrated multiple website platforms, developed and launched new strategic priorities, merged multiple units into one department, um, created departments uh, from scratch, and so much more. I revisit my top 10 change rules from time to time and update it based on past and current experiences. Today, I'm sharing with you my most recent iteration. I live by this motto that you see on the screen. Don't confuse the strength of your desire for change with your change with the probability of success when leading change. While your enthusiasm and persistence are helpful when managing a change initiative, if you want the change to survive and thrive over time, you need to build a strong foundation. These 10 rules of change will help leaders better manage change to help staff get on board and work together to achieve a shared goal. But before we get to the rules, let's talk a little bit about change and change management. So what is change? So I looked it up in the dictionary and one of the definitions is to make someone or something different to alter or modify or to replace something with something else, especially something of the same kind that is newer or better or to substitute one thing for another. Sometimes change can be planned and sometimes changes happen because external forces not under our control force us to change. Change can be new business strategy, a change of leadership, a new policy, or an implementation of new product. So how do we help those that we are asking to change successfully manage the change process? This is where change management comes into play. Change management is how we prepare, support, and help individuals, teams, and organizations go through change. Why do we need change management? Well, change usually puts people under stress. When implementing a change within an organization, 
you need to not only focus on the project management piece of implementing a change, but you also need to address the emotional and psychological transitions people experience as they go through major change. Supporting people through the transition that change creates rather than pushing forward and ignoring all the messy stuff is essential as you and your colleagues go through a change process. While managing a major change can be hard, overwhelming, and even a little bit scary for those leading the change as well as those being asked to change, if done well, it can also be a time for innovation, creating organizational resilience, and strengthening the organizational culture. So how do you sell your vision for the future so staff rally around it and create it and sustain it over time? I hate to say it, but there's no secret sauce. Change management processes help staff change their mental model so they can transition from the current state and move to accepting the new state. But there's a lot of things that you need to do to help prepare staff for the change. You need to not only focus on the change, i.e. how do you get people from point A to point B, you also need to address the emotional and psychological transitions that people are going to experience. While this is an important part of any change initiative, it is even more important now to ensure the psychological welfare of our staff and community after all of the external changes that we have gone through and experienced over the last several years. Now more than ever, it is important for leadership to lead with empathy and compassion during the change process. Supporting people through this transition from today to the desired outcome, rather than pushing forward and ignoring all the emotions and uncertainty change creates is essential for changes to work as planned and more importantly, be sustained over time. Your success rests on getting people to do and think differently. So how do we do it? So that's where my 10 rules come in. So let's talk about rule number one, make the case for change. The starting point of any effective change effort is the clear definition of the business problem or opportunity. The business case for change should answer the question that anyone affected by the project wants to know. Why must I do this? In any change, you are asking people to give up what is known, what they are good at, and what makes them feel secure. They may not necessarily like the status quo, but for many, it is better than the unknown that change brings about. To help staff begin to embrace the change and build excitement, you need to give them reasons why they should want to change. Do not make them figure this out on their own. Be as explicit and tangible as possible. To do this, you need to answer the whys of the change project. First, you need to answer the why this change is good for the, um, for the organization. So you should answer, why are we making this change? How does this change align with our organization's mission and strategy and goals? And how will this change make things better for the organization? In addition to answering these questions about the organization, you also need to personalize the change to help people see how they will be impacted by the change. And the two questions that you need to ask answer are, how will this impact me? And will it make life better, it will make my life and work better. Connect the dots for staff at the individual level and be as explicit as possible. Don't make them guess about the benefits. When you answer these five questions, you aren't just doing this once at the beginning of the change. As you go through the change process and learn more about the change innovation, the answer to each question should grow. You are learning more, and therefore, it stands to reason you should continually be discovering how the change will be better for the organization, the people that you serve, your departments, your teams, and your staff. Make sure you communicate with staff over time and remind them of the benefits you shared early in the process and continue to share with them how those new benefits you discover as the change, change initiative progresses. The answers should be compelling. As staff go through the process and become more active in the participation by attending trainings or meetings, reading documentations or whatever it else is that you are doing to engage people in the change, staff will also be able to identify why this change is good for the organization 
how it aligns to the strategy and how they themselves will benefit from the change. So it's kind of this two pieces. You're helping them see it, but then staff should also be drawing some of their own conclusions. You should revisit these questions throughout the change process because as you go through the implementation of the change, you will learn more about the change. Also engage staff across the organization and ask them for their feedback and input so that you can create a holistic picture of the benefits of this change for staff at every level of the organization. Rule number two, make sure everyone knows what role they play in the change. Early on in the process, you need to identify who will lead the change, who is impacted by the change, and who can successfully launch this change. A successful change requires everyone to play their role and everyone needs to know what role they play. The change, initiative that I have, the change initiatives that I have worked on failed because people didn't understand what role they play in the change. No one who was responsible for what was being done and no one knew what real authority, no one had real authority to bring about the change. These are two pieces that are really important to a change initiative. Before we explore some of the roles and responsibilities of the people involved in the change, I wanna state that while it's important to engage everyone affected by the change in the change process, everyone doesn't get a seat at the table that's planning the change. Michelle? More people, yes? I had a question that came in that might be timely, if you don't have at it. it. Um, someone asked, what if you discover as the change goes on that it is not benefiting people or the organization as much as anticipated? So do you have any thoughts about how to communicate that, especially if you can't really go back? Right, you know, that is a really good question. And um, I will talk a little bit about it later, but I wanna, I will bring it up right now because I bet people are gonna keep thinking about it. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that's really important in a change process is to be really truthful with your staff. And so when you go into it, you, is, uh, um, you, you are making the best decision that you can with the information that you have. And, you know, I know organizations don't usually go into a change um, without really doing due diligence because, you know, you're putting people through a lot. I mean, people who have to lead it are giving up other things that they have to do. You're asking staff to give up things. There's other priorities that sometimes have to get put to the wayside because of that. Um, and so um, I think people understand that you you were going into this with good intentions. But when you go through it, sometimes you learn things that you didn't know that you didn't know. And that can really change um, how you approach it. And so I think you, leadership needs to have a really um, honest conversation about it and decide whether or not they wanna move forward. And um, if they even decide to move forward, but notice that maybe some of those benefits aren't gonna be realized. They need to be truthful and explain that to the staff as soon as possible, and then explain to them why they are still continuing to go through this change, because they must have done a cost benefit analysis and decided that even though we're not gaining as much as we thought we would, um, we are still gaining things that make this change worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. For okay. That. Oh, no problem. That was, that was a great question. <laughs> um, and so, um, while everyone has this role, I just I think that the piece I want you to take away from this is that um, I have been part of change initiatives where you sit at the table and the change team is like 30 to 40 people. And that just makes things um, really difficult because the change team needs to have authority and they need to be able to be held accountable. And when you have that many people sitting in the room, it makes it really hard um, to identify who actually has the authority and who actually is going to be held accountable if things aren't going the way that they should. Um, so instead of a large group, you need to have an implementation team that looks more like this. And I'm not saying it has to be these exact people. It's just more that it needs to be a small team that looks engaged and, and they're talking with each other. Um, it should be made up of key stakeholders that are dedicated to the organization and the project success and they are people who should be able to provide direction and support. Um, as a group, they should work together to lead the change and provide guidance to others who will be impacted by it. They should be empowered by leadership to implement the leader's vision, which also means that the leader has to have a strong vision and that vision needs to be imparted to this team. Because not only do they need to understand it, but they're going to need to continue as they go through this implementation process to um, tie back this change initiative uh, to uh, the overall vision of the organization. 
So let's look a little bit more specifically about what the implementation team does as part of the change initiative. So creating the implementation team is a very important part of the success of a change initiative. So choose this group wisely. It is also important that this team understands the roles and responsibilities. And some of the duties of this, the person, sometimes I found that change initiative maybe only has one or two people doing it. Um, and if it's a larger one, you know, between four and maybe, you know, 10 or 11. So they need to successfully achieve the organizational goal of implementing the change. They need to identify and work with the individuals or teams needed to make the change work. So when I said before, like you don't want to have an implementation team that's huge, um, that doesn't mean you're not including others in the change process. You have a core group that is shepherding and managing this change, but they are going to be bringing in other people from out the organization who can help um, support and buttress and um, push forward and make this, this project excel across the organization. One small group can't do it, but they're identifying those people, those levers within the organization that can help make an impact on successfully bringing about this change. They need to assess, identify, and mitigate the risks, the obstacles, and concerns that can impede successful implementation of the change. And that last question that we got from one of the audience members about, you know, what is it um, you know, what, what do you do if you're noticing you're not seeing it? This is the group that should be able to hopefully see that this change might not be going the way that is expected. And this is one of those groups that should be definitely uh, raising their hand and letting leadership know um, if the change may not see the promise that um, is being talked about initially um, in the, you know, that early launch phase. Um, they should work with key st stakeholders to craft messages as part of the ongoing communication plan. Again, it's really important that this team, even though it's a small core group, is really going out and listening to and um, incorporating what it's hearing from the people um, that are part of the organization. And they need to help identify the training, the knowledge, and the policies and the skills and the resources needed to close the gaps so that staff have what they need to enact the change. It's a lot of work, but again, they're not doing it alone. As the change progresses, the team should be bringing in more people into the process. Those individuals or teams that can, for example, be tapped to review the policy, provide training, analyze processes, or whatever, whatever, whatever other task the team can think of that needs to be done to successfully enact the change. The more people actively engage with and champion the change, the more chance you have for success. While the core team stays small, the number of people actively engaged should grow day by day. Engagement can include those things we already mentioned, like analyzing processes or creating policies, but it can also be you know, something a little bit more simple, like attending trainings, practicing what you're learning, um, or even just reading um, you know, the, the communications and the documentation that are coming out that are informing, informing you of the progress of the change. If the implementation team is not the leadership team or does not include a member of the organization's higher leadership roles, then the implementation team must have a strong link with leadership to ensure that the leadership is providing the necessary organizational support that is needed to implement the change. So let's explore some of the ways in which leadership, and by leadership, I mean like senior leaders, um, the directors, the commissioners, I know all libraries call them different things, you know, the executive directors, the presidents, whatever it is that you call them, but like that kind of top leadership um, of um, your library or your library related organization for which you work. So as I said, in some cases, senior leadership um, is participating and um, sometimes they're not. And even if as a senior member, you are not actively leading the change, which is uh, which happens a lot. Um, you also play an important role in the success of this change. Your staff is looking to you. They are looking at your verbal and nonverbal cues to determine how they should engage in the change. If you show that you're disengaged, that you're not providing the support that's needed, and you do not share information, the staff under you is more likely not to engage in the change themselves. I know that senior leadership has a lot of responsibility and whatever change is going on is just one of a long list of things that you are currently working on. But senior leadership must show engagement in this change if they want the staff to engage in it as well. To do this, senior leaders must actively advocate for the change. Um, this, you know, make sure that you're 
you know, you're talking, you know, you're, you're including it in your emails. When you're talking to staff, you're bringing it up. Maybe if you see somebody in the hallway, you're talking about it and you're in the elevator talking about it. Just show people that this is something that is on your mind as you're going about your day-to-day -day activities at work. You need to champion the project across the organization and actively participate. How do you do this? Well, examples include just kind of what we talked about before, which is, you know, talking with staff and asking them questions. Um, if there's a training or a workshop, um, I've always liked to have a senior leader come into the, one of those sessions and maybe introduce the speakers or do a brief introduction about the change experience about where we're, we're currently at with the initiative. Um, you need to ensure that the teams that you're leading are on board and understand how the change affects and benefits them. Make sure you're talking to your direct managers and your team members that report to you about the change. Ask them about it, ensure that they have the resources they need, and make sure they're, they're doing the same thing with the staff that report to them and with their colleagues. So you're kind of, you're, you're modeling the behavior that you want, and then you're asking them to do that with their staff. Make resources available. So make sure you're giving your staff time to not only attend training, but to continue to practice and build their skills after they attend training. Is there something you can stop doing or pause during the particular time intensive part so that staff can more fully engage with the change? That's something you might wanna talk and reflect on. And finally, regularly communicate the change. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to rule number four. So. When I originally did my change rules, um, I really focused a lot on the role of the change, you know, the implementation team and the role of senior leaders. Um, but over the last 10 years, I've really come to get a deeper understanding of the importance of the roles that supervisors, managers, and team leads play um, in the success of a change experience, especially those supervisors, managers, and team leads that are, um, are um, supervising the people who are directly impacted by the change but have the least amount of agency when it comes to the planning or implementation of the change. They're the ones you're kind of just telling what is going to be happening and, and they're engaged in some ways, but they're not really designing or co-designing uh, this change experience. And so um, one thing that's really important about uh, this group of supervisors, managers, and team leads or whatever it is that you call them is that you need to make sure that they are engaging um, their staff and providing them with the information and support that they need to support the teams that they manage. If they are engaged actively in the change initiative, they will be they will they will work to ensure that sure that their teams are actually engaged as well. The one thing I, I find in change experiences is that we're not really explicit with the supervisors, managers, and team leads about what role that they have to play in the change initiative, what they need to do to support their teams. Um, I find many organizations just assume that they will know what they need to do. Michelle? So maybe, yes. Another question that's yep. specific here. Uh, do you consider board of trustees and or department heads and or managers under senior leadership or just a, a director, CEO? Um, I would consider, you know, every organization is different. And so you kind of need to look at your own um, organization. I usually consider the senior leadership to be the people who ultimately make the decisions. So not those that make the recommendations, but those that actually do the, the uh, a sign off on the big things. I mean, not, you know, like, you know, not like a purchase order or uh, not that those things are important because I've, you know, had uh, those type of fiscal responsibilities, but those that actually get to drive and make the decisions that move the organization in whatever direction that it's going. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? So um, some cases a board of trustees is, sometimes they're not because every organization interactions are just a little bit different. So you need to kind of look at your own organization and make your best guess. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So um, as I was saying with the supervisors and managers, um, and, and that's actually kind of a good question because um, you know this group, I think we just assume that they're gonna know and we need to let them know what they need to do. And so um, I actually try to engage and actually have meetings with um, or encourage those on the implementation team to have meetings with um, this group and walk them through what the expectations are and how they can engage their staff um, in the change. So, you know, they need to ensure the team is on board and understands how the change affects and benefits them. And they're going to be able to do that because they get to have a lot of face time with the staff 
um, that you as an implementation team or a senior leader or even upper leadership may not actually be able to do. Um, they make sure that resources are available to make the change. If they themselves can't make those resources available, it's up to them to start working their connections and the, um, you know, the, the, staff, the organizational structure in order to make sure that those resources become available. They need to regularly talk about the change with their staff, answer questions related to the change, and ask questions of their staff to ensure that their staff really are understanding the change. So don't want, I don't want this just to be a one-way communication. I really want these to be conversations that are happening between you know, the, the, the supervisors, managers, and teams and those on their teams. Um, they should be open to ideas and suggestions on how to process and procedures can be improved to save staff time and improve patron services. If it applies, they can work on those things um, within their own group because maybe there's something that's very specific to them that you know, could benefit and they could work on that change together. Um, if it's a change that would be better for the organization, then it's up to the supervisor, manager, and team lead to either you know, lift that idea up to the implementation team and senior leadership or I prefer this to strongly encourage your staff to actually lift up um, that idea um, to those that can make those decisions. And then this, uh, the supervisor, manager, and team lead should also work with your team to evaluate, update the workflows and policies that work with the change. So, you know, make sure that, you know, the implementation team is doing its best to make sure that you have all the tools and that they've identified what needs to be updated. Um, or changed in order to successfully implement the initiative. Um, but there are certain things that only your team might know. And so it's up to you to figure out what that might be and to then let, um, fix it and let the implementation team know what it is that you're doing so that you're ready for the change when it goes live. Um, another group that I think is really important are the change agents. And so, um, and this is a group we don't really talk about. Change agents are people within the organization that help change happen by inspiring and influencing others. Uh, some may be managers, supervisors, or team leads, but I usually find that many of the change agents are staff with no official leadership responsibility. Change agents are the trusted staff by their peers and therefore are the people their colleagues turn to when looking for reassurance and guidance with um, going through a change. They should be tapped to openly help promote, champion, and support the change. If asked, they will actively work behind the scenes to make the change happen. Um, work with senior leadership, supervisors, managers, and team leads to identify people throughout the organization who can reach out to to help advocate and champion the change with their peers and let the implementation team know who they are. And if they don't know who they are, make those connections. Their support can be used to inspire and influence others to come on board and support the change initiative. As you move through the process, you will want to identify and ask them to insist in more tangible ways to support the change, maybe by asking them to help develop or lead a training, ask them to test a new process or review or comment on policies. While they are working behind the scenes, their work and value should not be hidden. Make sure their contributions of these individuals is being recognized and rewarded. And then finally, I think this one kind of is, um, we all know who this group is, it's the stakeholders. These are the people um, that we're asking to change. And so even if staff do not have one, one of the roles that we've already mentioned, they are still playing an important role in the change. They are the ones that must accept the change. They need to give up what they know and what is comfortable and accept the new. The change management process focus on the individuals and groups who are impacted by the change to help them navigate the change. They need clear guidance on their roles during the change. So be explicit about what it is that they need to do to prepare um, and also um, remind them about this, the process. So don't just say like, you know, you're gonna have to attend training on this day and make sure you remind them. If you want them to practice things, make sure that you're reminding them and working with the supervisors, managers and team leads to actually ensure that they have the time to do it. Um, most of the stakeholders are not guiding or leading the change. So it is important that you're building in mechanisms to ensure that they're being heard. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth when we talk about the communication uh, rule. And they also have ideas to share. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk about um, communication. But just remember that, you know, um, uh, one of the major roles of these groups um, that we just talked about was that, you know, it, the communication needs to be both ways. You need to be communicating down. You need to make sure you also have communication mechanisms going up and that people are being engaged at all levels of the organization. Okay. Rule number three, we are all processing changes at different times. 
It is essential that you stay engaged and communicate the change to staff throughout the process. As this slide illustrates, different staff are hearing about and engaging with the change at different times. This means the staff is going through the emotions associated with the change process at different times. You can't start moving through the emotions associated with the change until you hear about it and realize that you are being impacted. The sooner you are involved in the change process, the sooner you begin processing the change. Usually because senior leaders know about the change first, they will be steps ahead of the rest of the organization. Even though you are ahead, you need to make sure that you are you and your teams are you are reaching out to your teams and those that are not as far along in the process and showing them the way because you've already start you're farther along so you know what might they might expect as they go through the change process. If you're not seen regularly engaging with the change, the staff aren't going to engage either. Um, the sooner that you actively engage in the change, the sooner you begin going through the process. The one thing I, I want to note is, even though on the on the right hand side, um, you see a list of emotions that are associated with the change. So what happens the beginning versus what you're going to be feeling towards the end. You're not going to go through these in the exact order, but it kind of gives you this idea of that you are going to be kind of going through this myriad of emotions as you go through the change process. Um, and so um, just rem the thing I always just like to remind people is that um, especially as a senior leader or an implementation team, you can sometimes get frustrated because staff are so far behind in the change process. And remember the reason why they're behind in processes and understanding the change is because they've heard about it and started thinking about it a lot longer than you have. So um, I just kind of, I love, I actually have this picture sometimes up on my wall when I'm going through a major change initiative to remind me to be patient and to have empathy for those groups that have learned about it a lot later than I am because they should be given the same amount of time to process those change emotions and to learn about it as I was given um, when I started leading the change. Okay, rule number four, Communication is key. And I'm gonna say that um, I kind of cheated a little bit when I wrote this change uh, <laughs> rules a long time ago, these four changes, these four uh, communication things were actually their own rules and I rolled them into one. So, um, sorry, <laughs> that's how I got 10. <laughs> um, so communication is key when it comes to successfully managing an organization through a change. Um, there are four aspects of communication I want to explore a, a bit more in depth. And they are um, communicate regularly, use tools other than email to communicate the change, listen and follow up, and instill trust so that communication is listened and believed. So let's look at the first one. While good communication can't guarantee success, bad communication can kill or derail a project. This rule should not be surprising, yet I find this is where many change management initiatives fall short. There's no such thing as over communicating, especially right now. Because radical change has been a constant companion for the last three years, regular communication is vital to ensure the organization stays on the same path forward. You want to all be moving in the same direction. Communication helps that. You may feel like you're a broken record. You're not. <laughs> Sharing the same or similar messages multiple times helps staff internalize, then contextualize, and then act on the information. They don't do that when they hear it the first time. It takes multiple times to hear that for them to kind of go through that whole process. The communication should explain what is changing, but just as importantly, I like to also reinforce those things that have not changed so that they know they still know that there's things out there that they know how to do. Remember, if you don't fill the communication void, your staff are going to do it for you. Your staff are anxious, scared, and confused. They want information. It gives them a sense of control especially in times of change. If they aren't getting it from you, they will find it someplace else. And that, the information that they're getting from that other place could derail your change initiative. Okay, the next one, and this one um, kind of, I think has taken on a new, uh, uh, a new important sense. Um, we now do, I think a lot more email because we kind of got in that habit, I think during the pandemic, but make sure you go beyond email. While email is an important tool for sharing information, and it's also a great resource because you can go back and you know look at it and read it again, it is not the only tool you should be using to communicate with staff. Staff won't change just because you sent them one email. The need to hear the message in different ways before deciding to accept the change. You, along with the rest of the leadership team, need to use your personal relationships with your teams to drive home the change. 
You need to help to take those messages from the implementation team and make it personal for your unit, whoever it is that's reporting to you. You need to help your staff connect the dots. Use all the communication channels you have in your arsenal to get the word out, including all staff meetings, team meetings, department meetings, committee meetings. I know this takes time, but believe me, it's worth it. The personal connection can go a long way in helping someone embrace the change. Okay, the next one, and we kind of, I've hinted at this, but it's, you know, not only do you need to listen, you need to listen, but the part we haven't really also talked about is that following up. So while it is essential that leadership is regularly communicating to staff, it is also important for you to have formal and informal mechanisms in place to hear from your staff. Staff need a way to share with you their feelings, concerns, and ideas about what matters to them. These interactions should be approached with empathy. Staff want to know that they're being heard, that you care, and you will take their concerns to heart as you move forward. You're asking them to do a lot. This is what you can do for them in return. These conversations can also lead to new ideas and new perspectives on the change. Great ideas come from all over the organization. Therefore, you need to ensure communication channels are open so those great ideas and the concerns, those are also important, are heard and elevated to the right people. Make sure you have a process in place to track these questions, concerns, and ideas, and that you have a process in place to, re place to review those, those ideas and concerns and how you're, going to re you know, how you're going to respond back with feedback. Staff become frustrated if they feel like the information they're giving to you is going into a black hole. If they don't feel like that they're being heard, it could lead them to either not engage or to begin to disengage with the change process if they were already engaged. Either way, it will make your change process harder. And finally, um, uh, related to the change is that be trustworthy. And we kind of, I think, hinted at this, but uh, let's go a little bit more in depth. While communication is important, without trust, staff will not trust the message. While there is a high level of trust with leaders, and their direct supervisors, staff are willing to give, oh, even, sorry, <laughs> even when even when there's not um, a strong level of trust. What am I trying to say? I'm sorry, I'm trying to change this on the fly and I'm not doing a very good job for which I apologize. Okay, um, when there's a high level of trust, um, uh, staff are more likely to go along with the change, right? But even if they don't have a high level of trust in you, there are things that you can do to begin to build the trust. That's what I'm trying to say. So even if the trust, trust is lacking, um, it can be earned. And I, there's three simple rules. Do what you say you will do. If you can't fulfill a promise, let the people know as soon as possible why you can't meet your promise and what you're going to do instead and why. And finally, don't overpromise and underdeliver. You can also build trust through your affiliations. How do you do this? Well, you need to find your allies. And this is where those change agents that we talked about earlier come into play because they're, threats, they're spread throughout the organization and they can help um, build trust in, the, in the, um, the change and the message through their peer relationships. So this is another way in which if you talk to, talk to your change agents and, uh, and build trust with them, they can then take that trust and hopefully maybe use it to actually build trust among their peers. Okay, this one is one of my favorites. Um, never let a good change go to waste. So in times of great uncertainty, create an environment where it will create an environment where you're most accepting to try new ideas, change practices and find new possibilities. It kind of seems a little counterintuitive that they're already going through all these, all these other changes. Why would they be open to more? Um, but they are in certain situations. So therefore, you should use this time to explore additional changes you want to implement that support the change initiative. And I want to be clear, if you are going to try to address additional changes, they need to at least align to that core change that you're doing. Um, it's easier to implement changes during time of change than it is when things are calm. The additional changes should support the new behaviors and attitudes you want your staff to embody once the change is completed. 
If the behavior or attitude you are trying to introduce does not relate to the current change initiative, staff will not embrace it. New behaviors and attitudes should align with your case for change. New behaviors and attitudes should align with that case. So what changes should you consider as an organization? Here are some prompts that I've used um, with teams when we've tried to talk about and think about what other things we may wanna consider as we're going through the big change. And so some of those questions include, what workflows need to be redesigned? What new policies or procedures should you explore and implement? What existing policies need to be reinforced? And my favorite, and I will say this is sometimes one of the harder ones to have a conversation about is, what maybe should you stop doing um, as part of the change? What are those things that you've been doing, but you're like, why do we still do this? This might be the time to maybe stop doing that as you go through the change. Before we move to the next rule, I just wanna reiterate that the additional changes you choose to make as part of the change initiative should support the new behaviors and attitudes you want your staff to embody once the change is completed. If the behavior or attitude you are trying to introduce does not relate to the current change initiative, staff most likely are not going to embrace it. You know, sometimes there is this too much change. The new behaviors and attitudes should align with your case for change. Now, just because um, it doesn't align doesn't mean you just forget about those ideas that might've come up in these conversations. Um, I usually tried to keep this list of other things that had been identified and I kept a running list of those so that if another change initiative came down, I would look at them and see, is there anything that we talked about in the past that we didn't enact that we might now be able to introduce in a future change? Okay. Rule number six, be flexible and embrace ambiguity. Personally, this one is my favorite, but I know embracing ambiguity is hard for many. <laughs> Change is messy. While there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, the path is not straight. It is not always clear. And sometimes those who are participating in a change will need to switch directions and try something new in order to keep the change moving forward. Sometimes you do need to go back in order to move forward. Because of this, you will have to become comfortable with ambiguity. Sometimes you will need to have, you will not have all the answers that you need and neither will the people who are leading the change. I know this is a little scary. You will have to make the best decisions you can with the information that you have. And sometimes you're just, it's gonna have to be okay. There's usually nothing that can't be undone that was done because you didn't have all the information. That's not always the case, but I find most people are more afraid of making a decision because it might've been wrong. And sometimes making the decision, learning from it, and then changing course is sometimes the better uh, way to do it. Um, these uh, three things might sound familiar because I used it to answer an earlier question, but the way I look at change and project management is that there's three bu buckets. In the beginning of the change, the list for change um, you don't know will be longer than the list of the things that you do know. This is to be expected, this is new, and therefore it's only natural you have a lot of unanswered questions. The only way that this list is going to re you know, get smaller is by going through, um, is through time through your curiosity, learning, practice, and sharing, and hearing feedback from your staff. Um, as you go through the process, your list of the things that you know that you know is gonna grow because you're learning. Um, but the other thing I want to talk about um, is just mention is that there are things as you go through the process that you don't know that you don't know. And you're going to have to, I think, be comfortable with that. Um, and uh, that's where the um, embracing ambiguity comes in is that things are gonna come up that are just gonna be like, I just had no clue. And uh, take a deep breath. Um, it wasn't a failing, you didn't do something wrong. Um, this is new um, and therefore um, work together as a team to figure out what your path forward is going to be. You may have a roadmap, but roadmaps can be changed. And if that, if something that you didn't know kind of starts to kind of derail something, remember that while you do have a roadmap, roadmaps, um, you know, as with road work in Wisconsin, you know, the construction season, you know, everybody there, you know, sometimes you have to go through a detour and that's okay. So rule number seven, recognize what is being lost. Um, when I created my rules of change in graduate school, this rule was not on it. But after going through countless changes, both as a leader and as a follower, I noticed that some staff had problems accepting the change because they were not given the time to let go of what was lost. 
Change is letting go of something old in order to make room for something new. But I find that we sometimes focus so much on the getting to the end goal of the new that we forget to recognize what it is that we're actually leaving behind and recognizing what place that thing um, had for the organization. You know, it had, whatever it is that you're letting go had a contribution and that contribution should be acknowledged. Um, it's okay to mourn those things of which you are losing. And so um, as I, I talk about this, I try to have conversations about knowing, letting people know that the work that they did that we're letting go had value and that the work that they did have value. And I try to tie in how some of those things are seen in other parts of the organization. Because usually what you're letting go didn't just, um, wasn't just in a bucket. It wasn't, that's not, it, 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 it touched other pieces. And so there might've been things that were learned um, from this, whatever it is that you're letting go that also had impacts, you know, those ripples across the organization. And so I try to acknowledge that. Um, I let staff know that they're their work contributed to moving the library's vision forward so that maybe we're letting something go, but um, because of the work they did, it made this new thing possible. And then I also try to remind staff that their expertise and experience still has value for the library. Um, and so um, I, I ask that as you go through a change experience that remember to kind of honor what it is that you did, the contributions that staff made to that, and how that is actually helping to move the library, the organization, the strategy, the vision forward. Rule number eight, change takes a lot longer than you think. So many people think that the change is done on day one, but it's not on day, your, your change doesn't end on your go live date. While this is one of the major milestones of the change process, you still have a lot more of the change process to navigate. You're still learning, you're still exploring, you're understanding and grappling with the change. On Go Live, you're putting into practice all those things that you learned as you prepared for the change, but now you're getting to see what it is, what you learned and how it goes into practice. And you, you sometimes find that there's still things that you need to learn. As we said in rule six, you will need to be flexible and embrace ambiguity because even after whatever that go live date is, you're still figuring out your path forward. Don't get me wrong, this day should be celebrated. But I find that staff get frustrated when they realize the day after go live that there's still really a lot of change to go through. So as you go through change, um, you are going to notice that staff um, are gonna have a, a period of time where they're not as productive. And so I think um, people call it the dip. And it's when you're trying to, you know, it's, it's when you're putting into practice all those things that you learned and you're getting comfortable and familiar with the change. And what I'm, gonna, what I'm asking of you as a leader or a manager, as a supervisor, or even if you're, you're taking this track because you wanna learn how to become one. So as a colleague, remember to have patience and empathy with staff as they kind of go through on like with day one and a couple of days after that change, because they're just getting comfortable with it and let them know explicitly that you understand that things might take a little bit longer, that there might be a, a few more hiccups than normal with processes because they're still learning the process. And I think it's really important for us. I think we know that this is gonna happen, um, at least as leaders, but I don't think we always talk about it. And so I think it's really important that we acknowledge it and let staff know that this is gonna happen so that they're prepared and also let them know that we're gonna support them and that we're patient. Uh, and that um, I always like to say that, um, you know, when this is all over, you are going to know this change better than you knew what was before, um, but it will take time to get there. Rule number nine. Identify successes in tangible and measurable ways. Most change management projects takes months or longer. Those managing projects need to ensure they identify metrics that can be used to ensure that the project is on track and to detect early warning signs so the organization can determine a corrective course of action. Identify the important milestones and how you are going to measure the success of the milestones early in the process. And then the other thing that I think is really important, especially since change uh, initiatives can take so long, is make sure that you celebrate both the small and the big wins. You know, you, you're going to identify those milestones when you've hit them, when you have those measures in place, you've identified you've hit the measure, make sure that you are then celebrating each of those milestones. That helps, 
you know, build momentum for the change. It keeps people engaged in the change. And as people see those milestones being ticked off, they realize that um, they are making progress. And sometimes that progress can seem slow. And so this reminds them, one, that the organization is still going through it. And two, that you are taking one step closer towards seeing that change become a reality. And finally, rule number 10. When the change, you need to reflect. So when the change is coming to a close, I find it's important, especially for leadership, to reflect on the process. And I'm gonna say, I didn't have this on my original list of 10, um, but this has become a really important part. In fact, I do this with every change initiative I work on. You know, bring key stakeholders together and debrief the experience. Discuss, you know, questions like, you know, what did you do well? What would you change um, if you did it again? You know, what did you learn about your organization, about the people that you work with, about the community that you serve? What would, what are your next steps? You know, what is it you want to do after this change becomes more of the normal? While the change may be coming to a close, a lot of ideas are generated during the change process. This review of ideas can help create a roadmap that can be used to evaluate and implement future changes around the organization. Write the answers down and put them someplace you can find them for your next change process. Do not delay this step too long. You wanna reflect on these questions while it's still fresh in your memory, but don't do it on like go live or that first week. Give yourself a little bit of time to kind of work through uh, what happens on the aftermath of when you go live. A word of warning, I notice when people do this, um, sometimes they spend most of the time focusing on what didn't go well. Um, and while I think it's important to debrief what didn't go well, I think it's also really important to identify what did go well so that you make sure that you do those things again in the next change initiative. And if you don't write those things down, you can sometimes forget. It'll be like, God, we did something the last time that worked really well. What was it that staff really liked? And then, you know, it can be lost. So make sure you're, you're documenting both what it is that you want to continue doing to ensure future success and what are some of those things you might want to train do differently the next time. Okay, so as our session comes to a close, let's revisit, you know, these 10 changes that I came about and they're here on the screen. I want to say, remember, this is my list. If you wrote your own, it may look different based on your past experiences, your strengths and your weaknesses, and the organizational culture you work with. Change is hard. The people who know how to manage change can help staff get on board and work together to achieve a shared goal. I hope in today's session, you learned about some of the tools and strategies you can use to engage staff in your next change initiative. And before we come to a close, I just wanna put this one slide up here. Um, this is a book that I use um, kind of, I call it almost like my, this is my, my manual of change. It's um, a fairly simple reading. It's not a huge book. Um, but it's managing uh, transitions, making the most of the change. And what I love about it is it's a very practical guide about how do you manage, how do you incorporate project management and the change management pieces together in organizational change. And so um, I use this book and reference it all the time. And so uh, this is my, my little last uh, recommendation to you is to check this book out if you have a chance and you wanna learn more about the change. And with that, I open it up for conversation and questions. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. So many, so many good takeaways in that list. Uh, if you do have a question for Michelle, we have about five minutes left before we need to move on. Um, I, I like how you mentioned, uh, you know, about the, the grieving and the letting and acknowledging that somebody's work had value. So I think of when I'm creating maybe a, a document for something at work and it's from scratch. And then um, someone else, another coworker, might get out might get out the red pen and, and I <laughs> and make a lot of edits. And I, sometimes it's easy to think to it's easy to think, oh, well, none of that was good. And what I try to remind myself of is that it's it's hard to come up with something. It's a lot easier to edit something already in place than it is to come up with the idea and to get it on paper. Um, so that's something I guess I think I try to be mindful of. Um, when, when any kind of edits are made on a project. But I like, I like the idea of, like you said, acknowledging that. And uh, I think th th that's been eye-opening to me. So that's something that I try to do when um, a, a coworker or a colleague comes up with something. And then if I make changes, I try to acknowledge, I, if I remember, I try to acknowledge like, thank you for starting this. Thank you for getting something on paper so that I didn't have to. 
um, it, again, a lot easier for me to make those changes. Any, any thoughts on that? No, I think that's wonderful. I, I, I joked with some, I was working with someone and I wrote this, this document, they'd asked me to write the first draft. And I knew when I gave it to them, they were going to like totally uh, cut it apart and rebuild it. Um, but that was the point. I mean, the document is something that is going to be used and referenced by, you know, hundreds of people and one person's view, one, only, only one voice shouldn't be the final voice. And so what I did is I started that conversation, that document to me was the beginning of the conversation and the kickoff. And then those revisions are the continuing conversation that also then not only happened in the, you know, the track changes and the, the long list of comments, um, but it also then helped spur additional conversations with other people. And so what I looked at it, it was, I was starting that communication train of making sure I'm trying to engage all different people throughout the organization that have different views and experiences to make sure that they're heard. But I was just one piece in that. And then that train that, you know, like that track changes shows how many other voices were being heard. Thank you. Uh, Teresa in the chat said, I loved how you pointed out the fact that people go through a change process at different rates and experience different emotions at different times. It's so easy to forget that not everyone has been on board since the beginning of planning for change, um, you know, when, when did that idea become uh, important or when did that really stick out to you as you were, as you were creating your top 10 list? Well, I'll say like, you know, like I learned it in grad school. I mean, so the reason I went to get my second master's was um, I had been part of some major changes. I worked my, um, I, I worked in IT through most of my library career. And so I've seen some pretty successful and not successful uh, change management initiatives. And I was trying to figure out why is IT transition seemed to be even harder than a lot of other organizational changes. And so this, this program was fabulous in that kind of thing and learning all about not just change in leadership theory, but adult learning theory and, um, all, all these different pieces. And um, we talked about it. And then, but I remember it was, I was standing in front of a group of people uh, doing a training and they, uh, it was obvious nobody was really on board. It was a room of 30. And so I just finally was like, okay, I'm like, I'm putting the timer up. Just talk about everything that's giving you problems. We're going to stop the training. And then they just started talking. And I was just like, oh my God, these are all the things that I was thinking when I be, when I first learned that we were going to do this change. Like these are all the concerns I had, but I've had five months to get on board with this. And they've only been thinking about it for three weeks, of course. And it, it, it was hearing all of them say almost exactly what had been going through my head five months before. It was just like, right, right. Remember that, you know, remember that, you know, Hirsch's timing model. And so that was when I put Hirsch's timing model on my wall when I would go through a major change. So I would remember that process of like, it's not fair to ask them to go through the change process in three weeks if I had five months. You know? <laughs> so yeah, it was, I knew it in practice, but it was the hearing of it and being like, oh, right, right, right. When you have to put that theory into practice can sometimes be a little difficult. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle, for a great session. As, as we mentioned in the chat, uh, Michelle's slides and the recording will be on the conference website uh, by Monday, uh, maybe before then, but by Monday for sure. Uh, so you can follow up with that. Uh, there also will be a short survey when we closed again, when we closed today, and we appreciate your feedback. So if you are sticking with us in this track, we will be back at one o'clock with 15 things to know if you are a new library director. We also have our stretch break coming up in 30 minutes at noon. Uh, so I will be at that, maybe even doing some stretches. So hopefully we will see some of you at one or maybe both of those. And if not, I hope you have a great rest of your day. So long.